If you're interested in learning about solid oxide cells, welcome. Let's start with the why. Our planet is suffering from climate change. Climate change is mainly due to a high amount of carbon dioxide entering the atmosphere. But we still depend on burning carbon to power our lives. Burning carbon releases carbon dioxide. A better option is to burn hydrogen with oxygen to make water without making carbon dioxide. We need to use hydrogen for power so we can be carbon neutral, but hydrogen is expensive and in short supply. Therefore, we need to make sure we're using hydrogen efficiently for power. When we just burn hydrogen with oxygen to make electricity, there's a lot of steps in between. This makes the process inefficient. What if we could just skip the middle steps? This brings us to fuel cells. Oxygen reacts with hydrogen because it wants to take hydrogen's electrons, and hydrogen is fine with that. When we burn hydrogen, oxygen gets electrons from hydrogen very easily. The electrons go directly to oxygen. What if we could make those electrons go through a detour, through a light or similar electric device, before getting to oxygen? This type of setup is called a fuel cell. In order to get a steady flow of electrons, or current, to keep our light on, we need something else to cross sides to complete the loop, or circuit. Solid oxide cells, or SOC for short, are a particular type of fuel cell. They are called solid oxide because oxygen completes the circuit. Let's take a closer look. A solid oxide cell has two modes, fuel cell mode and electrolysis mode. In this schematic, we have anode and cathode and a thin solid oxide electrolyte in between, usually made from yttrium stabilized zirconium oxide, operating at 600 to 1000 degrees Celsius. In the fuel cell mode, the cell is providing energy to light the bulb. The oxygen ion moves from the cathode to anode to form current inside the cell. Hydrogen gas and oxygen gas are supplied to anode and cathode respectively. Hydrogen reacts with oxygen ion from electrolyte to form water and provides electron. Oxygen consumes electron to form oxygen ion. Electron travel through the outside circuit to light the bulb and is consumed in the cathode. Oxygen crosses the electrolyte to anode to be reacted in anode, so that we get a complete current loop for the fuel cell mode. In the electrolysis mode, we revert the whole process by an external power source. Cathode and anode will swap since we define the cathodic reaction to be reductive. Water is applied to the cathode. Oxygen ion and electron are formed at cathode and anode respectively. Their movement form a complete current loop. The energy from the power source is then transferred to the chemical bonds inside the created hydrogen and oxygen. And that's the intro of the working principle. Let's switch gear to learn some history of the solid oxide fuel cell. In 1853, the first solid oxide gas cells were invented by Gauguin. In 1897, the first industrially produced solid oxide gas cells were equipped in a lamp to be the Nernst lamp. In the first half of the 20th century, several theorists and experimentalists were working on solid oxide fuel cell. In the 1960s, a rapidly growing number of scientists worked on different problems of solid oxide fuel cells, and by 1970, the basis was established. Now scientists are making solid oxide fuel cells economical, such as pursuing lower operation temperature. And this is how a solid oxide fuel cell may look like in real life. We start with a small cell that provides 25 watts and stack them together. A few stacks combine together to be a server module. Four to six modules constitute a server that provides about 300 kilowatt power. And we can further combine the servers to be a megawatt power solution. Now, let's compare a solid oxide cell to another two traditional cells, proton exchange membrane cell and alkaline cell. Basically, these cells are named after their electrolytes. The charge carriers are different. Let's first list this the fuel cell mode. Here we use fuels to generate electricity. Solid oxide fuel cell features high operating temperature. This brings both benefits and challenges. High temperature accelerates reactions, so solid oxide fuel cell does not need very precious catalyst. High temperature also improves the efficiency significantly. 
and allows for flexible fuels, which means that not only hydrogen, but also carbon oxide and hydrocarbon can be used by solid oxide fuel cell. What's more, solid oxide fuel cell generates high quality heat, which can be used for combined heat and power applications. However, high temperature also means high requirements for materials and seeding. Now let's see the electrolyzer mode. When we use electricity to generate fuels, the comparison is similar to that of the fuel cell mode. Just pay attention that in addition to electricity, solid oxide electrolyzer can also use heat as power supply, which is much cheaper. Solid oxide cells can have a wide range of applications. First of all, solid oxide fuel cells are well suited to stationary power generations for homes and businesses. A household solid oxide cells would produce both heat and power, removing the need to buy electricity from the grid. A large-scale residential program in Japan, known as Inner Farm, has had about 200,000 fuel cell units installed. Secondly, solid oxide fuel cells are power vehicles with as little as zero emissions. In recent years, major manufacturers including Honda and Toyota have developed commercially available fuel cell cars. As another famous example, London's RV1 bus route is now powered by hydrogen fuel cells. Finally, as the most efficient means of electrolysis, solid oxide electrolyzer cells present a step change opportunity in wind and solar storage, turning the excess renewable energy back into fuels. Today, solid oxide cell technology is being developed in many countries across the world as a power storage solution for renewable energy. So, how close are we to fully embrace this technology? It is estimated that a 30% reduction in manufacturing costs is required to make solid oxide cells commercially competitive. Therefore, one central theme in the solid oxide development is to lower the operating temperature of the solid oxide cells. The lower operating temperature results in two key advantages. First, it allows for lower cost materials to be used for manufacture. Second, it allows for more cost-efficient stack and system design, which requires less energy for operation. However, reduced operation temperature is not simple. The functionality of a solid oxide cell depends on the system's capability to conduct electrons and ions, as well as its capability to catalyze surface reactions. All of these properties depend strongly on temperature and tend to be sluggish at low temperatures. Therefore, considerable research is going into cell electrochemistry and material science to allow new design which can perform electrochemical process at lower operating temperatures. Solid oxide cells have proved its efficacy and new designs that allow lower operating temperatures will help to create commercially viable systems. The process is still ongoing and we look forward to your contribution to this field to realize a carbon neutral society.